Good morning, church. Uh, we want to thank God. It's Wednesday, and uh, we are here to hear the word of God. Uh, I believe that um, it is only through listening and through reading the word of God that we came to understand who God is in our lives. Let us pray. Oh God, from your providing end, even the dissatisfied and the grumbling receive what they need for their lives. Teach us your ways of justice and lead us to practice your generosity so that we may live a life worth of the gospel. Make known through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I will call Brother Ben to come and read the Word of God. Great Wednesday, and I hope you're all going really well and your families are all well this, this week. It's uh, been a bit miserable, so uh, hopefully the, the sun will be shining soon. And uh, the, this morning I'll be reading Exodus 16, 1 to 15. The manna and the quail. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the fifth day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt, in, in the desert the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people who are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gathered on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out up of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumblings against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, he, took, he looked towards the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumblings of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will all know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given, you, given to you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. And this is the word of the Lord. Uh, amazing message. And we'll get Johnson back to share his word for this week. Have a great week. Thank you, Ben, for the reading of the word of God. Uh, let us come to prayer. Friends in Christ, God invites us to hold the needs of our sisters and brothers. As dear to us as our own needs, loving our neighbours as ourselves. We offer our thanksgiving and our petitions on behalf of the church and the world. Lord God, friend of those in need, your son Jesus united our burdens and healed our spirits. We lift up all the prayers of our hearts for those too burdened, those seeking healing, those in need within the church and the world. Be with us this morning. In your name I pray. Amen.
This morning, I have decided to share with you on the theme, a cure for complainers. A cure for complainers. A man goes to dinner every day and he orders lunch. After all, the manager asks him how he liked his meal. The old man replies, it was good, but you could give me a little more bread. So the next day, the manager tells the waitress to give the man two slices of bread this time. Afterwards, he asks, how was your meal today? Oh, it was good, the man replies, but you could give me a little more bread. So the next day, the manager tells the waitress to give the man four slices of bread. How was your meal today? The manager asks. It was good, he replies, but you could give me a little more bread. So the next day, the manager tells the waitress to give the man a whole loaf of bread, neatly sliced with his meal. Again, the manager asks, how was your meal today? One more time, the man answered, it was good, but you could give me just a little more bread. So the manager is now obsessed with satisfying his customer. He orders the staff to bake a four foot long loaf of bread. The, ne the next day, when the man comes in, the manager is the safer place that enormous loaf of bread right next to the man's plate. The man sits down, devours his meal, including all of the bread. Then the manager asks him his usual way, how was your meal today, sir? The man replies, it was good as usual, but I see you I beg to give him only one slice of bread. I have a feeling that nothing the manager would have done would have satisfied this customer. Our lesson for today from the book of Exodus begins like this. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, they were set around paws of meat and ate all food we wanted. But he brought us into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. It is comforting to know, I suppose, that 3,000 years ago, Moses had to deal with the grumblers and complainers. It reminds me of the story of a lady who was a veritable found of complaints. He was talking to the pastor. The pastor came to see her one day and she began to enumerate some of her complaints. The neighbor's children are so noisy. I even can't sleep. They play outside, be outside their house and they make a lot of noise. People at the church never come to see me. Even nobody rang me, even giving a call at me. My anxiety is getting worse. The weather has been so terrible. On and on she went with one complaint after the other. Finally she said, but do you know, Pastor, I have had the worst headache all week, but suddenly while he's talking with you, it's gone. And the pastor sighed and said, oh no, your headache didn't disappear. I have it now. Married people also have to put up with complainers, don't they? Sometimes, one man had inscribed on his wife's tombstone these words, Here lies my wife in earthly mold, who when she lived did not, did not but scold. Good friends go soft in your walking, lest she would wake and rise up talking. Of course, women have no corner on the complaint market. I dare say that a survey would show at least as many grouch, grumbling men as women. Men of you would say, say a lot more. Moses had to put up with a whole nation of complainers. The Bible says they were murmuring. Have you ever heard people murmuring? We all have. The ironic thing that often is, it is people who have the least to complain about who are the worst murmurs. There's something about having much that makes us feel we deserve more. True, the children of Israel were out in the wilderness, but at least they were free. At least they were headed towards their own homeland after spending centuries in slavery. Even more
more important, consider the might acts of God that they have witnessed. The parting of the Red Sea. The Passover experience that had finally melted Pharaoh's heart and heart. Still they grumbled. What has God done for us today? That is what they were saying. I have known people like that in my life. What hope is there for mamas? Is there any cure for complaining? First of all, it would help if we confess our pettiness. Many of us simply do not have grounds for murmuring. We have been blessed far beyond what we could deserve. Many of us know that deep in our hearts, we are aware of our good fortune. Intellectually, we know that there are millions of persons who would gladly trade places with us. Our mothers taught us the little line, I cried because I had no shoes, until I saw a man who had no feet. We look at our lives and all that we have, and we know that every day we ought to offer a testimony of thanksgiving and praise God. But still we complain, we still murmur. I don't know about you. I am tired of learning from my mistakes. I want to learn from doing things right. Life is filled with frustrations, aggravations, trials and tribulations. Life has many downers. We would not try to minimize the fact. Sometimes, however, we need to step back and put our lives in perspective. We need to count our many blessings, as the old hymn says. We need to confess our pettiness. We also need to acknowledge God's provisions. The greatness of God is shown in his response to the people's murmurings. Sometimes when our children seem ungrateful, we respond defensively. We are angered by their attitude. We want them to see and appreciate all that we have done for them. Something boils within us when they shrug off our sacrifices as we really should have done more. That is a human response to lack of gratitude. It is not God's response. God had the people murmuring and he responded graciously, as he always does. In the face of their grumbling, God provides for their needs. He provides manna from heaven. They gathered the manna each morning, and when it dried in the sun, they had a stick sold food which was edible and nutritious. God also provided quail. Every spring, we are told flocks of birds cross the Red Sea, where they lay exhausted near the coast and easily caught. This is exactly how the Bible describes God's provision of meat for the wilderness wandering. God also provided water. Scholars tell us that many porous rocks in the desert contain water. God led Moses to such a rock at Raphidim. Moses struck the rock and outpoured water adequate for the whole company. God had the murmuring of the people and provided for their needs. Of course, he would have provided for their needs even if they had not murmured. God is a giving God. If you cannot see that, you will probably never change your outlook on life. You will never have the gratitude attitude. I am certain that there were cynics among the Hebrews who sought to offer a rational explanation for the quails. The manna, the water from the rock, the cloud by day and the pillar of cloud by night. God has placed us in a world that must be seen through the eyes of faith. When that great Scotchman Robert Bruce was fleeing from his enemies, he took refuge in a cave. By the time his pursuers reached his hideout, a tiny spider had spun a web over the mouth of the cave. Seeing that, that web, his pursuers concluded that Robert Bruce could not possibly be hiding there. After they left, Robert Bruce got out on his knees and thanked God for that spider. Now, was the spider building a web in front of his hiding place as a coincidence or a divine providence? Did the spider simply happen along to build this web or was it guided by a divine impulse? Each of us must decide for himself or herself how we view life. When you had that bad accident and walked away unscathed, did you say, thank God? Or did you say, whoo, I was lucky at that time? There are men and women who live by luck, who don't live by the grace of God, who don't see God helping them in their life. 
Life is a matter of interpretation, but the person who sees the gracious hand of God at work is in far less danger of becoming a complainer than is a cynic. Who sees only random chances with no plan or purpose. When you receive the grace of God, you always praise God and say, thank you, Lord. A cure for complaining will begin with a confession of our pettiness and an acknowledgement of God's provision. So the third ingredient in our cure for complaining or our medicine for murmuring, however, is more demanding. It is that we discover God's purpose for our lives. That is the most important cure for complaining. So God's purpose for our life is that we are to save others. And then he stopped complaining. Dr. Carl Maringa's former prescription to a lady who was depressed was that she got out and find who needed her and yell that person. That is all the best prescription for chronic complainers. Complainers are invariable, centered on themselves. They never think of anyone else. Their world is themselves. Not upon God, not upon his goodness, not upon their neighbors, not upon their needs, but upon themselves. It's only about themselves. So the Hebrews knew themselves to be chosen people. The Exodus experience confirmed that. They were God's own, a holy race. What they sometimes forget was that they were chosen for a purpose, to be a witness for God to the nations. That is what they were chosen for. So Israel was God's own beloved. God brought them out of Egypt not to live a life of privilege, but of purpose. Not to be saved, but to save. We who are the new Israel of that same Samoan, we are called to save others. I've heard so many people in the church, they always complain. It's all, all their complaints is about them. It's nothing to do with others. It's nothing to do with saving others. It's all about them. Have you ever known anyone who truly and reservedly gave his or her life for others who was a complainer, a grumbler, or a mama? People don't grumble as much when grateful and joyful they give their life to saving God and other people. They don't. Someone once said that the most dangerous place to complain is the front steps of a church. I would like to overhear your conversation as you leave this place. We could find out in a hurry whether this message has any effect. Are you a complainer, a grumbler, a mama in your life? Isn't it time you confess your pettiness? You have so much for which to give thanks. Isn't it time you acknowledge God's bonches provision? Isn't it time you quit thinking about yourself and consider the purpose for which you were created? The children of Israel murmured just as you and I sometimes mum. But God provided for their needs just as he provides for our needs. God was at work in their lives. God is at work in your life. Why are you murmuring? Why are you complaining? Isn't it time we say, thank you, Lord, for what you have given us? The problem is that we try to compare ourselves with others. So at the end, we cannot see what God has done to us. Because we are always looking to find out what others. Isn't time we begin sharing those blessings with others? God has blessed us beyond measure. He has given us life. Think about other people. Who are unable to walk. I've seen people in wheelchairs thanking God that they are still alive. I've still seen people who are disabled, who are thanking God that they are still be able to do other things. What about you? Stop complaining. Stop grumbling. And say, thank you, Lord, for the wonderful time we are having. Stop complaining starting today. Count your blessings, name them one by one, and you'll see what the Lord has done for you. God bless you. Amen. Let us pray. God of hope, when your hungry people long for the slave food of Egypt, you open the doors of heaven and rain down manna. Feed us with the bread of life at your table that we may taste the freedom of eternal life and lead lives worth of our calling through Christ 
our Lord. Amen. May we receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.